Hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to everyone and welcome to the very first session of the Cambridge Global Schools Festival. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world today. I'm Charlotte Pritchard and I'm the Head of Product Marketing for Secondary ELT at Cambridge University Press and I'm your host for this session which is entitled Education for a Sustainable Planet. So I'm looking forward to introducing you to our speaker shortly, um, but before I do, I just want to say that you are welcome to post any questions in the Q&A box, and I'll be pleased to relay those questions to our speaker at the end of the session. We will also be posting a link for you to download your certificate of attendance for today's session towards the end of the webinar in the chat box. So click on the link, download the certificate, you can then put your name in the blank space and um, save it or print it out. But don't worry if you miss it because you will receive an email with the talk recording and the certificates on Friday. And finally, the PowerPoint slides from this session won't be shared, but the session is being recorded and will be made available on our Cambridge ELT YouTube channel in a few days time. So, on to our exciting first session of the festival. Um, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Matt Larsendor. Matt is the education manager for WWF UK, the world's leading conservation charity, working for a future where people and nature can thrive together. He's also chair of HVP Nepal UK, supporting schools and projects in Nepal that aim to transform society through education based on human values philosophy. Over to you, Matt. Thanks so much, Charlotte. I'll just share my screen. So a very warm welcome. Thank you so much uh, for joining me today um, and a huge thanks uh, for inviting me to be part of this fantastic event. Um, so. As, as you heard, WWF is the world's leading uh, independent conservation organization with a mission to create a world where people and wildlife can thrive together. So you might be wondering, why am I opening a schools festival uh, rather than uh, a talk on pedagogy or education policy? Why the environment? And the reason is because it matters to education and it matters to educators. And that's not just because it matters to everyone, as of course I might say, but because it especially matters to education because of the role that education plays in our society. There have been schools of sorts for more than 500 years of human history, all working to educate in some way, but they haven't taught the same thing in the same way throughout history. They've responded to the knowledge of the time and the situation of the time and the needs of society at the time. A school has to teach about the world with the aim of of preparing students to go out into it with the skills and values that they need. And that means responding uh, to the world as it is at the time. And right now, there is no bigger need that society has than the need to address the existential threats faced by environmental crisis. So today, I will say a little bit about the state of the world, but not too much because this isn't a lesson, a bit more about why that matters to you as educators, and a lot more about why you matter to the world. And I hope to leave you with some inspiration for how we as educators can play a role in shaping a sustainable future and also leave you with a sense of what your next steps should be to start making those changes and having an impact. Because ultimately, I truly believe that no one can do more to save the world than educators. So no pressure at all. So this is a time of change for better or worse. And as educators, of any subject, we need to be aware of the context in which we're teaching, just as we are with the pandemic that we're currently facing. On a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the climate crisis and biodiversity loss are not affecting our school life in the same way as the pandemic is, but it's still the context that our students experience of life and of, edu and of education. The context of the information they learn, the skills they're told will serve them in the future, and the values that we encourage them to take out into the world. You may have heard of eco-anxiety, sometimes called eco-despair, um, and it is very real. We know that young people are concerned about what they're hearing about the state of our planet and what that means for their future. 
Now, we have a duty to our students to consider how we curate their educational experience in light of what we know they are dealing with. We need to be sensitive to their mental health, but also to have an awareness of how their education can be a positive force in addressing the causes of anxiety. This sense of uncertainty, helplessness, and the anger that they might feel in the face of a crisis that they didn't cause. So in doing this, we can even do our bit to fight back against the crisis ourselves. So I hope to cover all of that in the talk today. So I mentioned that I wouldn't talk too much about the issues themselves. Um, it is useful to give a little bit of context, however, um, but rather than just uh, hear it from me, I thought I'd just show a very short video, which is actually uh, created for the classroom, uh, where Sir David Attenborough, the naturalist and broadcaster, uh, will just give you a little overview of the situation in which we find ourselves now. Hello, I'm David Attenborough. Our planet needs your help. Human beings are changing every part of this amazing planet. These changes are so great that scientists are saying that we have entered a new age, the Anthropocene Epoch the age of humans. This means that our actions are shaping the future of our planet for better or worse. At present, we are using up the Earth's resources faster than our planet can replenish them. This is now a threat to us and to the amazing creatures we share our home with. The future of our planet is in our hands. We must understand how the natural wonders we depend on for our survival can be sustained forever. Explore the natural treasures on your doorstep and discover what you can do to help restore and protect wildlife all around the world. Connect with other young people, find strength in numbers and unite to protect your future. Together, you can save our planet. So that's our mission. So I'll mention uh, as well as part of this context, the Living Planet Report. Um, this is a report that uh, WWF brings out every two years. Um, and the importance of this report is that it works from the idea that the world works like a living system. All the different living processes uh, that are taking place around our planet result in there being the conditions that we are used to and that we need in order to thrive as a species. The planet is one living system in the same way that a body is, um, made up of different living systems uh, of our organs and all contributing to um, life and uh, our, our functions as humans. So living systems, um, including the biomes of our planet, huge environments such as the ocean, the freshwater, the jungle, they themselves have lots of parts and they all need to work together for the whole thing to play its part in the global system. And the reason I bring this up is because we talk a lot um, about the climate crisis. We talk a lot about climate change. Um, and that's perhaps the thing which students are most concerned about and which is uh, where we see the most uh, mobilization of young people um, in calling for change. But this idea uh, that the wild of our planet, the living systems of our planet are actually essential for us to have a healthy planet on which we can live and thrive is also extremely important to get across. And the story of the living planet this year um, is as it has been since we started producing the report, uh, a slightly frightening one. Nature is declining. Populations of wildlife have decreased on average by 68% since 1970. So that's not 68% 60, of animals uh, gone from the, an uh, from the planet or 68% of species. It's every single species of uh, animal that is studied for the report has declined in numbers by 68%. And humans are the cause of this loss of biodiversity. Overfishing, over farming, uh, conversion of land, use of pesticides in farming, plastic pollution, climate change caused by fossil fuels and food waste, which means that we're producing uh, so much more than we actually use. And why does this matter? 
Well, humans need nature. We need it to grow our food, to have access to fresh water. We use it to produce energy. We need it for the, uh, the climate uh, to be stable and for the air to be clean. It's extremely important for our health and also our well-being, our mental health. So this loss of wildlife from the planet is an extremely important crisis we face. How can we bend the curve of this loss? How can we make that graph that shows biodiversity uh, dropping year on year? How can we bend it back up? And that's an extremely important issue for us to be aware when we're talking about the climate crisis and about all the other uh, issues of, of concern to our students, um, because it's often overlooked, but it's actually one of the most important things. And we're at a pivotal moment in the history of our species right now. This is the first time in our history when we've been able to actually understand the impact we are having on the world. And it's the first time we've had the means to act, to save nature. We have the technology, we have the scientific knowledge, uh, we have all of the Lego bricks that we need to build the future that we want. But what we actually make that future look like is still up to us. And the decisions that are made in the next few years will shape the next 100. So human activity, we know, is changing every part of our planet. And these changes are so great, as you heard from David Attenborough, um, that some scientists are saying we're entering a new epoch on our planet. And uh, what that re really means uh, is that we are changing the conditions for life on our planet. If you look back through the fossil record of our planet, you can see the changes in epoch as lines in the fossil record when the conditions have been changed normally by a great cosmic event like a meteorite or geological events uh, causing the atmosphere to change and that means the conditions for life change and therefore life changes but this is the first time that a species on our planet humans have actually been responsible for a change of that scale and so this is the context that our students are living in a moment that has never come about before and which will, it cannot ever come about again. And this Anthropocene theory uh, is a really interesting way of thinking about the crisis because it sounds scary, but actually it also provides us with a sense of hope. Because what it means is that humans are the greatest force for change on our planet. We are the ones responsible for uh, all of these uh, changes that we're seeing in the conditions for life because of the huge impact that we have on the landscape and on wildlife and on the atmosphere. And we can use that power for good. We can shape a positive future. And what we need to do is think about what that positive future needs to be like for us to have the future that we want in our lives. And we need students to feel this potential. We need students to feel this potential for positive development so that they don't just focus on the crisis as it stands and the need to avert disaster. One of the most famous youth voices of recent years, Greta Thunberg, uh, famously said to UN world leaders in one of her powerful speeches, change is coming whether you like it or not. And she's right. The way that we live now is going to change. It will change either as a result of the effects of climate change and biodiversity loss, meaning that we can no longer do some of the things that we currently do, some of the jobs that we no longer uh, will be able to do in the future because um, they, they no longer work, um, and current lifestyles will no longer be possible. Or change will come because we bring about change before that happens to prevent those effects. And that's a much better option. That second option gives us the power to choose what that future looks like rather than be forced into a future that we have no choice over. Now, some of the biggest changes need to happen in the next eight years to really prevent huge disaster. So that means the students that we teach today, what they take out into the world is going to be uh, really important because it will affect the jobs they look for and the lifestyles that they seek to have. And those are going to be different from the lifestyles and the jobs that we currently experience today. And young people are not helpless in this. This isn't just something that we need to do to make sure that young people uh, have a future. They are creating their own opportunities. They are fighting for their own future. They're stepping up all around the world, taking platforms and using their voices to call for the changes that they can see 
are needed. And their role in shaping the future is huge. And what we would really like to see is this energy that is currently they're being forced to put into calling for the changes that are not happening that they know are needed. If they could use that energy positively to prepare for their role in shaping a better future, then that would be better for them and better for the planet. And education provides the opportunities to prepare young people for this future. And that means equipping them to be part of the solution, but also to make decisions about their own lives in an informed way to ensure a positive and happy future for themselves. School can prepare you for any future, but only if it's looking at the world of today and seeing how the future can and must be different. So what does that mean for us as educators? It means that we have a duty to students. Our duty is to inspire and equip them to drive this positive future, but also thrive in it. That means understanding the issues ourselves and what they will mean for the future, and having a duty to be as informed as possible about the way the world works, how we came to be in this crisis, the route that can take us out of it. Because only then can we respond to students when they're confused or concerned, and only then can we help them to prepare to be a force for good now and in the future. So this does not just apply to the teachers of the subjects that might seem related to this. This doesn't apply just to geography teachers, science teachers. This applies to all educators that are working with students and nurturing them to be the next generation. And educators have to be time travelers in a, in a way. The work that you do today will only really have its full effect in the years ahead when the students you have taught start working, innovating, voting, starting families and so on. The values and the knowledge that you give them today is going to start taking effect in the world in the future. And when teaching, inspiring, supporting and mentoring students, we have to be thinking about preparing students for the world as it will be, not as it is now. So unlike most in society, we have, as educators, we have to be thinking with our minds in the future, because that's really what we're working to shape. And so I just wanted to give you uh, a few points that I think are really important um, for us to take into the work that we do as educators. If we really want to bring uh, this positive thinking into the, the lives and the minds of students and prepare them to be this force for change. So the first is teach the connections. I've mentioned uh, how our planet um, works like a living system, like a body. It's the same, uh, the result of that is that anything that we do that has an impact on the planet has an impact on other areas of the planet. Issues are not isolated. And if we look at one issue uh, and not look at all of them, then uh, we're not necessarily able to address even that single issue. Foster a connection with nature. Young people do not need to be taught to value nature. They need to just have the opportunity to experience it. And then the wonder and the complexity of nature draws them in. It's exciting, it's fascinating, it's enriching. But if young people are not given opportunities to experience nature firsthand, to get out, to get their hands dirty, experience bird song, the sound of, of uh, wind in the trees, um, then by the time they can seek those opportunities out for themselves, they might be somewhat immune to them. Fostering that connection with nature is incredibly important and it's particularly important at schools because schools can be a great leveler. You can't say for sure uh, what students will have those opportunities at home. It depends on the interests of their parents, where they live, um, what their parents uh, are able uh, to do, whether they have a garden, whether they are near a park and so on. And at school, you can make sure that all young people can socially have those experiences of nature. Thirdly, we need to build sustainable values. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means in practice, because that's the real core of this. Um, and that's nothing to do with what you teach in the classroom. It's about the experience that you can have um, as a student at school, within a school environment, and working with your peers and uh, with the guidance of teachers. Fourth, we can support and empower students. We can actually uh, show them that they are considered to be uh, a valuable force for change, that their voices are relevant. 
Um, and that means giving them opportunities to make decisions within school life um, and uh, to support them uh, to feel confident in bringing about changes um, in their own lives and beyond. And lastly, we can nurture hope. And I've mentioned this a few times already, I'm gonna mention it again. It's so important that we don't see our mission as simply trying to avert disaster. There is hope for a, a really positive future and we need to think about what we can do to create it. So I want to uh, just very quickly touch on a few of the terms that I've used um, just to make sure that the points I make kind of make sense when you take them away from this talk. And so one of the things I've mentioned a few times is this idea of, uh, of a system. And some of you will be really familiar with, with system thinking, and some of you um, might not have had to really use those terms before. So what do I mean when I, when I mention a system? So this little bit is just going to be a little bit like a lesson, but it's just to make sure uh, that some of the key points that I've made make sense. So the definition of a system is where you have parts and they can re really be anything, um, and those parts together have a function. That's a system, so it's really simple. Um, but I'll just illustrate what that means in practice. If you have a pile of books and they're on different subjects and they just, you know, strewn around the room, um, then that has various parts because there are more than one book, but that's not a system because it doesn't have a purpose. They haven't been brought together to perform a function. And that means that that is just a heap. And a heap has no function, it's just a collection of parts unless you're a cat, of course, because cats will always find a function for uh, a pile of books, especially if they're the books you need for an upcoming webinar. However, we can apply that same set of rules to anything uh, that we experience in our lives. So take a big building with lots of rooms, lots of potential there, but until uh, other parts are brought in, it has no specific function. Add an educator, had students and a system for them to come through and, and take part in lessons. And suddenly you do have a system, you have a school. So we're all part of a system as educators. Uh, and our function is to bring education to students. And of course, that means that those parts and the books within that school suddenly are all part of a system that does have a function, which is getting an education. So. To go further than that, um, some systems are made up of parts that cannot have a function in their own right. So books obviously do individually uh, have a purpose and, and they are useful things and they can take part in lots of different systems. Um, some parts uh, have no value outside the system in which they're in. Um, you need all of those parts to be assembled in the right way and those connections are what gives it its uh, ability to perform that function. And so it's only by assembling the parts of a bicycle in the right way that you can end up with something that can actually perform a purpose, which is a form of transport, as for this velociraptor, which is a really good pun, by the way. So a reason I wanted to dive a little bit deep into this idea of what a system is, is because I've already used it a few times and I want to use it again. Our planet is a living system, and that means that every single part of it is connected. For those of you that have seen the Our Planet Netflix documentary series that's now available for free for anyone to watch on YouTube, um, this is the message of that series. It looks in each episode at a different biome, um, but it's showing how they're all working together to ensure that the planet itself can support life. <clears throat> So this idea of system thinking is something we can apply whenever we're thinking about the environmental crisis, when, whenever we're talking about any real world issues. And it's really important because our tendency is to go for stories. We like stories, stories that have a simple arc, stories that start with a threat. And then there's a solution presented that you can fight for. And then when that solution is achieved, you have your resolution, you have problem solved. We are constantly putting things into stories, things that happen to us in our own lives, things that we see in the media. We apply stories, whether we realize we're doing it or not. And I'm sure a lot of you will, will be aware of this and will introduce this idea to your students. And it's really useful because it helps us to communicate things. It helps us to remember things. 
um, and it puts boundaries around something that otherwise can be a bit scary or confusing because it's got so many complex parts and it just makes it manageable and helps you to understand uh, what needs to happen next uh, to get the outcome that you would like, the end to the story that you would like. We like a dragon to slay. We like a problem that we can see, point at, and then go and fight. So Blue Planet 2, for those of you that saw that show, um, it showed a particular problem. It wasn't the subject of the series, but it showed uh, the impact of plastic pollution on the ocean. And it captured the imagination because pe people can see the problem. They can see it in their houses, the shops they visit, and even in ecosystems that they visit in, in wild landscapes. They can see bits of plastic. They can see that the problem's there and they can think, okay, I can see against it. What can I do? Um, and that's great because that is a problem and we do want people to feel like they should try and address it and that they need to address it. But the problem with these simple stories is that they don't have the whole picture. And when you understand that each thing that you see is part of a system, um, it becomes a really important way to think about how we can come up with a solution. When this nuance, when these complexities are missing, it can cause confusion. I've had conversations with people about plastic objects um, being bad uh, when they're actually useful or harmless, toys that you're gonna keep for life and they're not going to enter the ecosystem, but they're resilient and they're safe for, for children. Tupperware, again, it's something that you're just gonna use over and over again and it can actually stop uh, single use uh, waste and food waste and all sorts of things. Medical equipment where we need the properties of plastic um, to, to serve a really important purpose. And the issue is not plastic. We can't hold plastic up like a dragon and fight against it. The issue is the amount of single use plastic making it into the ecosystem. And if you think of all the different steps along the way that leads to what you can see on the slide now, um, it's not just a case of plastic being in existence. It's uh, plastic being uh, created and used for things that doesn't need to be plastic. You don't necessarily even need those things at all. You definitely don't need things to be packaged in the way they are. And then you've got people uh, able to create those things and sell them without taking any responsibility for the impact on the environment. Then you've got people buying them and choosing to buy them over things that might be less packaged and then throwing that stuff away. Then you've got the problem with things being thrown away, not being recycled. And so all of these different things result in something going into the ocean. It's not as simple as just trying to, uh, to slay that dragon. And you can apply this, this idea of systems thinking, thinking about all the complex interrelations between uh, different parts um, to any issue. And it's so much more valuable when we want uh, to come up with a solution that will work. And that's something that we really need to try and embed in the next generation. It's something we really want to encourage students to apply themselves, not to learn a set of, of um, of facts about, for example, plastic pollution in particular, but to learn to look for those connections and to think about the complexity and to think about how things are part of a wider system. Things are never just bad or good. It's about uh, the, uh, the other things that are um, in play that lead to them either having a bad or a good effect. And so this can sound a bit frightening. It feels like things are so much more complex than perhaps we would like them to be if we want to actually engage students and if we want to get students to understand what they can do. But actually, a reassuring point for you, it comes down to one core principle that you can teach, and that is the importance of sustainability. And it's actually really simple. We use the word sustainability a lot, um, and it's used a lot by businesses, uh, by companies, by the creators of products. And normally they just mean, oh, it's a bit more environmentally friendly than it might be. Actually, sustainability is a very simple concept, but it can only mean one thing. It means what we do, we must be able to do forever. If an action or a product um, results in uh, destroying the things that are needed to do that in the future, then it is not sustainable. It could not carry on forever. And again, nothing is good or bad necessarily. No lifestyle choice, no diet choice, no product. It's just that the total of all that we're doing needs to be in balance. We need to be doing things that nature can cope with. So this means we need to change the way we think, not set a, put a set of rules on the way that we live. Students need to have sustainability as a core value and they need to know through experience what it means in practice. 
And that means going across and beyond all school subjects. Every subject and activity can and should be informed by the importance of sustainability. <clears throat> And when I talk about sustainability, you may well uh, think of the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Global Goals, um, thinking about the, the positive future that we could create by achieving these 16 goals and the 17th being working in partnership to achieve them. Um, and all of these being uh, equally important. And they are, they're incredibly important for a future in which humans are equal and have a healthy, happy life. But right now, at WWF and other organizations would say, no matter how important they all are, we can't get away from the fact that we need to be focusing on the environments, those four SDGs that I put down in the bottom of that wedding cake, um, because they are the foundation for everything else. If we don't have a healthy planet that works the way it should, which means it needs to be wild, it needs to have all the wildlife working in those ecosystems, um, then we won't be able to think about producing enough food for everybody, having social justice, having stability in society that enables us to give everyone an education. So this is the context in which we're currently living. This environmental crisis needs to be our priority and it needs to be the priority uh, for all of us that are focused on the future. And that's something that all educators are. Sustainable development is about moving forward, not staying where we are. Um, and that means uh, developing in such a way that it makes things better now and in the future for everyone. So I've mentioned educators and education having this unique role to play in fixing these issues. And so a lot of that is about how we prepare students to play that role in the future. And I've talked a lot about that. But I, before I leave you and, and look at questions, I want to give you a sense of the unique power that you have um, as, a, as a teacher with a school in a school community uh, that you work within. The unique position that schools hold in lives and community means that they have the power to start shaping the future that students will inherit. They can take action now on some of the biggest issues of our times. So remember, a school is much more than a machine for educating students. That system uh, that I gave as an example earlier, where as soon as you have uh, students and teachers coming into a building in order to educate, you have a system with a purpose. That's the core purpose of education, of a core, the core purpose of the school. But it has so much more of a role to play in society. They are hubs of the community. They link hundreds of families with the current or past students. They link local businesses and decision makers. They have visibility in the community and often they convene people for events. Um, and uh, around uh, school events or school um, fates and so on. And what happens in school doesn't stay there. It influences wider society and the planet itself. So that means that anything that students and staff can do to help in the fight against climate change and biodiversity loss by bringing sustainability into all aspects of school life has this ripple effect across society and into the future. And uh, this diagram, uh, which is from our, our last year's Living Planet report, um, was it originally intended to show the value of individual actions, the point that like, however small your impact, it's worth taking your action uh, for the planet because it builds up and eventually leads to these big government um, and business uh, changes that can actually shape the world. Schools and colleges have uh, uh, an incredibly important role to play in driving individual action, but also bringing individual actions together into community action. And that's a huge power that you can play at this point of crisis, to be able to bring a school community together in talking about and thinking about acting on these key issues. And so we talk about a whole school approach, um, which means not just thinking about what you teach and the way you teach it in the classroom, but thinking about embedding sustainability across all aspects of school life. The culture of the school, yes, the curriculum, but also the campus, uh, which means thinking about how you could use the grounds of the school as to demonstrate good practice, to uh, connect students to nature, but also to have a really good impact on local biodiversity. And then finally, the community, thinking about what you can do to influence the wider community. And if you are interested in, in some practical steps for achieving that in your school, do check out um, WWF's free 
uh, CPD course, um, which uh, there's a, a URL for it there. Um, and uh, it's free, it takes about five hours in total, but it's five one hour courses, it's all quite manageable, and you get a certificate um, and a Microsoft uh, Future CPD badge um, if you complete. So I started with a little clip uh, from David Attenborough, just giving us the context. I wanted to also uh, finish just or almost finish with a very short uh, quote from uh, David Attenborough uh, directed at you as educators. People are the future of our planet. We must equip them with the information, insight and practical skills to understand the importance of biodiversity, both intrinsically and for the survival of humanity. Educators have a key role to play in preparing young people for the challenges that lie ahead. There can be no greater legacy than giving young people the tools they need to save our planet. So that's the last thing I wanted to say. Um, and I wanted to just leave you with um, this message that I've, I've given a few times throughout the talk, which is uh, the importance of hope. The future is ours to shape, no matter what challenges we might currently be facing as a species and as a society. Um, what's really exciting for students growing up today is the fact that there is going to be a new future. There will be a different future ahead and they can make decisions now that will help to shape what their future looks like. And that's actually an incredibly exciting and empowering uh, thought. And it gives a huge incentive to prepare uh, to be change makers for the future, to, to do well at school, to look for those skills which you feel would enable you to have the role that you want in that future. Um, so I'm looking forward to answering some questions and I'm going to just leave you with a short clip from our Future Visions video. Um, which is designed uh, for educators to use to inspire young people uh, with a sense of what is possible. Um, and this has a poem uh, over the top of it from a poet called Benjamin uh, Zephaniah, who's a, a British poet. Um, but there is a version of this video, and it's longer than the clip I'm going to show you, um, with, uh, with no voiceover and some other voiceovers from some other influences as well. Technology can make us stronger. Good tech stuff can help us prosper. Without greed, we can still do trade. Without greed, we can get it made. We can harness what nature gave us without letting greed enslave us. A modern future's possible. And that future can be beautiful. When we rose up, the land was bare. When pure beginnings filled the air. So imagine what we can achieve if we have hope and we believe. We can have our jobs and keep our friends and follow eco-friendly trends. If we apply our minds, then we'll make it green and keep it real. So hand in hand, let's do projects with love for generation next. We can fill the coming years with progressive new ideas. Love up the place, green up the space. We are really not the master race. There is no master but the child. So let's be humble and rewild. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, to some questions. Thank you, Matt. That was really, really interesting. And um, we're getting an awful lot of positive comments about your session. You'll be glad to know. Um, so I've just got time for a few um, questions and answers. Um, uh, so the first question, Matt, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals define sustainability more widely than environmental issues and biodiversity. By focusing on sustainability equals environment, are we moving away from the SDGs and is that okay? That's an anonymous question. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and um, uh, the, that wedding cake model that I showed you is, is sort of the way that I justify, if you like, a real focus at the moment on uh, environmental issues. 
um, the basis that we, the, the fact that we need a stable planet, a stable climate and access to real basic needs before we can actually apply um, those, uh, those principles um, that are also really important for just society in the future. Um, so it's not that those aren't important, it's just that right now there's a, there's a, there's a hill to overcome, there's a crisis to overcome. Um, but it is worth mentioning that uh, we fundamentally believe that whatever changes are made, even if they are just changes that are prompted by a need to address environmental problems, they need to have social justice at their heart as well. If we're shaping a future in the way that we address the current issues, we need to be, need to have in mind what kind of future we want to shape. And that needs to be one that's guided by all of the SDGs. It's one that needs to be guided by equality um, and, and all of those um, fundamentals that we think are important for human life. Great. Um, okay, we've got another question here from Hello School Online. Um, how do you recommend introducing this topic for young learners that is less than six years old? Uh, yeah, really good question. So um, we we kind of track a path uh, of, of the development of a young person. And at that age, we think that the most important thing that can be addressed uh, is their connection to nature, just giving them opportunities to discover uh, and, and sort of understand nature through practice, through just through experience, through being able to watch it and being able to, to, to see it in action. So we've got a number of um, uh, fantastic resources to encourage young people uh, to just explore and enjoy uh, the nature on their doorstep. Um, and obviously with, with uh, in school life, you can create opportunities for young people to have those nature experiences across any subject and outside subjects as well. And so I think understanding that there is a kind of pathway uh, that, that students uh, go through from early years all the way up to, um, to being employed and, and you know, being fully trained and so on. Um, and I think right at that early age, it is all about um, finding ways to connect and to discover uh, a passion for nature. And I think just uh, it feels like it's just uh, to, to build up their enthusiasm to stand up for nature in the future. But it's more than that. By experiencing nature, you start to see those connections and, and feel them uh, without necessarily even having to be taught them. Great. Um, I think we've got time for just one more question. We're getting a little bit near to the end here. Um, so can you suggest some examples of group projects that can be taken up at primary class level to promote sustainable values that ensure also ensure maximum participation. I think maybe one project, maybe Matt, um, in, in if you've got about a minute and a half, <laughs> okay. Sure, um, well, I think given what I've just said and, and that sort of focus on, on understanding and experiencing nature, I think one of the most amazing things that you can do is, is to have young people go out and explore the grounds of your school or, or whatever green space you have access to locally. Um, and just to, to uh, communally um, discover what the ecosystem has within it, but then come back together as a class and think about what you could therefore do to improve um, uh, the, the situation for nature. Um, and obviously it depends on your local environment, it depends where you are, and it depends what wildlife you discover is there or isn't there that you might expect, but it could be as simple as, uh, as planting some wildflowers, it could be as simple um, as growing uh, uh, some trees when you don't have any trees, but you do have lots of plants, um, or it could be something a bit more complex, like starting a, uh, um, a pond uh, and, and creating a new habitat that's going to attract new species and so on. And what's really fantastic about that is that students can see the direct result of something that they have been part of um, on the ecosystem, and then you can teach them how that's actually having uh, a wider impact as part of the global ecosystem. Brilliant, well timed. <laughs> okay, so we're drawing to the end of our session now. Um, so I just wanted to thank Matt for a fantastic session. Um, it's been really interesting with some amazing and thought provoking images throughout, I have to say. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today and some, some great questions. So just a quick reminder before the end of the session, you can download your certificate by clicking on the link and the session will be available to view again on the Cambridge ELT YouTube channel in a few days time. And next up in our programme today, we have an instant teacher takeaway session entitled Resilience, Keep Calm and Carry On, 
with speakers Rachel Jeffries and George Heritage. So thank you everybody and have a really great day. Thank you Charlotte, thank you everyone. Thank you Matt.